I'd like to welcome everybody, everybody who's joining us here live and everybody who's joining us via the recording, to the sixth episode of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness, hosted by Gary Weber and Richard Doyle. We're very excited to have both of these gentlemen here again with us for another one of these interactive journeys. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to them both and then we'll get underway. Uh, professor Rich Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a liberal arts professor, at, research professor at Penn State University, where he has taught since 1994. Uh, he's re uh, written recently a book, uh, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere, which focuses on the co-evolution of humans and with psychedelic plants such as psilocybin, cannabis, and ayahuasca. Uh, Rich has worked with us before here at Syncast, uh, both for the uh, show Exploring the Soul of Nature and a collaboration with Penn State University Radio Free Vallis. So we're excited to have him here again. Uh, Gary Weber has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He's worked in different uh, sectors, military, national labs, industry, and academia, uh, as well as R&D and management. Uh, He's written several books, Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening, and Dancing Beyond Thought, Bhagavad Gita Verses and Dialogues for Awakening. We're uh, thrilled to have you back here, Gary, and so I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Beautiful. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I think, as always this week, we want to emphasize the, the priority and power of questions. This is a path of inquiry and... Uh, so we're going to be welcoming questions from the very get-go. Uh, I am a professor by profession, so I can't stop talking. So uh, I'm going to say a little bit at the beginning about something I was thinking about today, just to maybe help uh, create the context for these questions. Um, you know, a lot of times when we um, teach self-inquiry, even the title, it sounds, you know, in Sanskrit, it's Atma Vachara, and that sounds kind of like, oh, that sounds powerful. That's like sounds like something that would do something to me. I want to roll that up and smoke that, you know. But uh, self-inquiry kind of says, well, yeah, you know, I'm inquiring into the self. It doesn't really, um, when you first start, if you hear that title, it doesn't necessarily bite into you. It doesn't. It doesn't give a sense of just how powerful this very simple, iterative, repetitive technique can be. Uh, and so the the phrase, um, which could be a little scary, but the phrase of, of empowerment also is that it came to me the other day is mind hacking, which is that, you know, as Gary has said in the past that, you know, human beings all around the planet are due for an upgrade on their operating system. Um, and that metaphor is a powerful one because I do think it's pretty much that straightforward. We're operating more or less on the metaphor of this localized, discrete individual self that we're supposed to be, that occupies some point somewhere, when in fact, an alternative metaphor, which is that we're a kind of field of awareness uh, that is manifesting out of a much larger field of awareness, is a much more uh, you know, healthful and remarkable metaphor to live by. But of course, we can't just treat it as a different label. We have to really experience ourselves as a field of awareness. And therefore, this process of self-inquiry, which consists of asking questions when we're faced with, say, some any kind of emotional response whatsoever, um, you know, who's upset that they got caught off in traffic? Who's enjoying the pasta that they're eating? When are they enjoying the pasta that they're eating? Uh, where is Jennifer's uh, image? Um, so this idea that uh, by simple questioning at first we kind of scoff at it, and so in order to empower, in order to empower the uh, aspect of this question, because all a computer is is a set of series of iterative constructions, uh, instructions. You're just giving commands to the computer. And uh, the commands that most of our brains are working out of, off of most of the time, which, as you know, you've probably heard Gary talk about in terms of self-referential internal narrative, is, you know, I want this, I'm no good, I'm good, I need that, that we begin shifting and 
altering that internal narrative by looking for where it comes from, saying, where is the eye that is having this problem? When is the eye that is having the problem? And that's really very, very much akin to sort of hacking the eye, slowly but surely hacking away at the eye. And as you hack away from at the eye, you get feedback. You start to experience almost immediately that these things that seem to have so much purchase on you before begin to have just slightly less power. And the world brightens a bit. It appears more kind of, you know, jewel-like and remarkable and miraculous. And as far as I can tell, that process continues as you continue this process, even as the process itself um, pre prevents, uh, presents fewer and fewer obstacles to your uh, process, to your progress. So this idea of mind hacking, which is something I wanted to start with that people might find useful. Gary, did you have anything to add to that? Brilliant as usual. Um, so it really feels like I've, you know, I grew up playing with computers and it really feels like I've, you know, with the help of Gary and with the help of ayahuasca and the help of meditation and the help of self-inquiry that I've hacked my mind into a different modality. And that other modality, believe me, is an upgrade, at least from my own humble experience. Something else for the newcomers, uh, we didn't have decent uh, scientific understanding of what goes on inside this brain until probably uh, 10, 12 years ago. Since then, there's been an explosion in people engaged, uh, resources dedicated to uh, many, many people entering the field and many, many papers coming out. We now have a very good understanding of what the therapeutic psychedelics. Gary, Gary, could you lean in a little bit closer to the mic, just a little bit? Sorry. What didn't you hear? Oh, I heard it. It was just a little uh, harder to hear, so I just wanted to see if you could lean in a little bit. Okay. Well, we Thanks. now know that therapeutic psychedelics, uh, LSD, ayahuasca, psilocybin, mushrooms, uh, operate in pretty much the same way as meditation does. It produces the same mystical experiences. We know what parts of the brain cause that to happen, and we can basically watch it in action in the fMRI and soon with an EEG, much cheaper piece of apparatus. So we have good, strong science backing up this previously just strange, wild, and crazy mystical stuff. Uh, we do know what the brain's doing now, how it goes about producing the things it produces. So do we have any questions, Jennifer? Uh, not yet, so just want to encourage people to send them my way on the chat. Uh, I know there was, in the pre, before we connected, there were a couple people saying they had them, so definitely send them my way, and we'll get them in. Yeah, well, one thing to add on that mind-hacking metaphor, maybe, um, uh, unless you had something else, was I was going to add that, that it's not just hacking the mind, is that when you start hacking at the eye, you know, what we would traditionally think of as the heart is involved. And as we've said, each time, uh, once the mind gets out of the way a little bit, there's a kind of you know, whole spectrum of feeling that starts to emerge, that one's interaction with one's own awareness and the world is much more tactile and uh, alive and dynamic. So, you know, we, we, we can talk about hacking the mind and the eye is operating off this self-referential internal narrative, but what opens up is also the heart. And so uh, there, there's not simply this idea that we're just, you know, altering ourselves cognitively that this is a serious opening of, you know, a human being to the full potentiality of their experience. And it's possible, you know, the traditional religions have sort of all pointed to this state, but they tend to claim that the state is only possible for rare adepts or after death. But as Gary was pointing out before, the state of the science is such now that we can see that, no, it's fully possible right now in the present moment. It's not something that we need to wait for uh, after death or that only certain adepts can experience. And we are finding too that um, not only just do the certain psychedelics work along with meditation, similar to meditation, 
but it appears as if we can take many, many hours off of the time required to produce a permanent change in the neural structure of the brain by coupling those two. Uh, it appears as if, if we have a psychedelic experience, I haven't had any, but if we have a psychedelic experience, then in fact that can take a lot of time off because it shows the brain what's possible. I mean, the brain needs to understand what is capable of. And it can see that, in fact, it can make many different realities. I mean, we kind of might suspect this, but you do find out that you can make many different realities. The brain then begins to understand that, and it's much more malleable than as you go into whatever it is, psychedelics or meditation. Uh, I'm a big fan of meditation, of course, and um, it works very similar, as we said before, but there may be a very... Uh, synchronistic possibility between those two to make the whole process go much faster and make it a lot more uh, accessible to more folks. Great. Well, I have a I have our first question here. If you guys are ready, sure. Uh, for that, um, Ivan asks, uh, can you ask them to talk a bit about the role of therapy and conventional treatments with people who come to this path? with certain problems, such as anxiety, disorders, phobias, etc. Are those two methods mutually exclusive, or, they, or can they be combined? Well, I would say that um, it takes a very skilled uh, psychologist to understand what's, what we're talking about here. My experience, very few, maybe even very, very few psychologists or psychiatrists are trained to understand what this non-dual awakening is, uh, they very quickly throw it into this category called depersonalization, derealization disorder. Uh, within DSM-5, the current psychological uh, guidelines, almost anybody could fall within some category there. And they find the category for this behavior, this situation. So uh, the tendency is to pathologize what we're talking about here. It's very different from what schizophrenia is or any of the other disorders that we talk about. Um, so it would depend which disorder somebody came to this work with. They may have been just misdiagnosed. They may, in fact, be coming into this process. There'd be nothing wrong with them, which often happens. They've just been told that there's some great deep psychological problem. If you've been with ADHD or uh, PTSD, there are ways we can work with uh, those things uh, synchronistically. But it really depends on what the person is, what meds they're taking, what meds they've done in the past and what kind of a psychologist they had they're working with. Yeah, I, I had a brief experience uh, with a psychologist um, oh, about 18 years ago that was very helpful for getting on my feet, but it was helpful precisely because it basically consisted of the kind of dialogue that Gary and I have together. Um, it, I, I think that I share with Gary, uh, or, or, or maybe I have even more of a mistrust of this idea that someone has these disorders uh, like anxiety or phobias, which are really labels that are uh, conveniently put on clusters of symptoms, all of which are highly individual. You know, each of us, part of the splendor and challenge of being a human being is that we're completely unique individuals, you know, coming to awareness in the world. And so when we get diagnosed in this way, it's, you know, pretty much antithetical to us experiencing ourselves as who we are. And like the reason I, I left that practice, and actually this was what the occasion that allowed me to go and use ayahuasca, was that um, everything was working, going along fine. And in fact, I was on antidepressants, which we now know uh, for at least moderate and uh, mild depression are no more effective than placebo. The, that's a Journal of American medicine, uh, Journal of American Medical Association, uh, that I, my only issue was that I needed to get a large enough supply of the antidepressants in order to not like go into this panic mode at the end of every month, try to get more delivered and so forth, because I was basically addicted to these, you know? And so I went to the, the psychiatrist because the psychologist was very helpful. The psychologist, the therapist, just worked with me in this dialogic ways and then would just say things like, oh, just say that again, you know, and push on that and query. I think dialogue is incredibly valuable if you can find somebody to do that with. But the psychiatrist, who, of course, was the one who wrote the prescription, when I went to him and said, look, I need to get more than a month's supply, and he looked at me 
with this kind of, you know, really sort of like one flew over the cuckoo's nest glance, you know, and he said, you are a psychiatric patient. He said, if I give you more than a month's supply, then you're a suicide risk. And I said, well, I'm a suicide risk on 30 of them, brother, <laughs> you know? And he said, see, that's what I mean, you know? So I think that there are very pernicious ways and we get in which we get put into these roles that I have anxiety, I have phobias, which I would really encourage people to work with self-inquiry. And when push comes to shove, you know, err on the side of self-inquiry, because I've worked with people who have then had psychiatrists tell them, oh, you need to establish a sense of boundary, for example, which is completely antithetical to the surrender into the fact that you are not in this universe, but of it and experiencing that and being open to experiencing that. Instead, you're buttressing your sense of separation between self and other and some sort of, to me, hopeless attempt to secure the ego against being against injury and death. So I guess the answer we're giving is a complicated one. If you find that you can get dialogue out of this experience and out of the psychologist and it seems to be working, obviously feel your way through that. But if it's a situation where you feel like you've been diagnosed and it doesn't really seem to be helping you thrive, I would encourage you to look at other modalities, which include self-inquiry. But the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, what some traditions call the inner guru or the inner physician is there to heal you. And as soon as you start listening to your inner self, you will figure out it, it, it will happen that you will be healed. You don't need to um, simply rely on external forces to do that. Yeah, I'd also say that <clears throat> Christian certainly support this, that um, I get many people who come to me who have actually been psychopathologized and they've been given meds and their problem right now, uh, they've had some really bad meds in the past. They were over medicated. And their biggest problem is the meds they were given. I mean, they were not nearly as uh, in such bad shape until they began taking lots of meds, and then med A didn't work. So they tried med B, and then more of med B, and more of med B, then back and forth, more of A, until they just don't know what's going on anymore. Uh, I see more of those, and I see people who are actually going through a successful protocol for psychological uh, wellness than I do people who've been grossly over medicated or badly misdiagnosed. So I, I, I'm i not a fan of this at all. The very first Science and Non-Duality Conference in 2009 in Santa Fe, California, they actually ran a whole parallel track uh, of psychologists who were coming there to be trained to try to understand what non-duality was. This is a science and non-duality conference. So they were trying to learn about non-duality. So there is, at least in the Bay Area and around the Bay Area, uh, a lot of interest in having this understanding of how this is so different from what they're accustomed to because some of the, psych some of the psychologists themselves recognize that, in fact, this is a, you know, happening more and more and more as we do more and more non dual stuff. And they need to be somebody there that they can understand this and not hurt people. I and mean, this Susan Segal that Rick was talking about, she saw 10 psychologists working their way up in France, up the west coast of California. And, um, some of them took advantage of her, or they seduced her. That's, that isn't all psychologists, but, but she, she finally reached the Bay Area, and she was really no better off in transit until she ran into some people who really understood what this was. And they just told her, hey, there's, you're okay. This is fine. There's not a problem with you. And she was fine. So um, I'd be very careful with uh, psychological diagnosis. Um, Ivan uh, followed up with um, asking in the chat. So, would you say that ultimately? So, so would you say there ultimately are such things as genuine mental disorders, or is it all just ego slash I slash me? I'm not talking mental illness, but disorders. Mm. Well, what's a good question? Where do you draw that line? Though, I mean, you know, that there are people who do need neurochemical adjustments. Their their brain chemistry is out of balance. That's not as many as we as we, we categorize, but there are people who really need assistance to be out in the world. However you break those out, there are people that need care. But that's a very small proportion in my opinion. 
Great, thank you. Um, I have another question here from Mark. And uh, working through self-inquiry and observing the internal narrative, I find myself working through potential future conversations. I think I have found that useful. I think I found that useful or am just used to automatically doing it. Is that something you continue to do or don't you find the need for it at this point? No, no. There's no need for it at all. I mean, I, and you can take it from a pragmatic standpoint. If you're projecting the future, just see how often you're correct. I mean, almost never are you correct at forecasting what's going to come out in the future. The scenario planning virtually never works out. So I gave up on it. I was just never very really good at it. But the, all you're doing is just more and more self-referential narrative and just found something that habitually you've done in the past and just, you're just continuing to do it. Or just ask who's doing this scenario planning. Ask who's worried about the future. Ask who's afraid of what's going to happen in the future. Now, it's not necessary at all. And, and not only is it not necessary, it really deadens and dulls uh, the actual conversations that you can have because you're you're so busy anticipating the conversation that you're not still and just aware enough to be able to feel where the other person is or what it is that they're saying. You're not really you don't really have ears to hear, as uh, Jesus put it. You know you're not responding. What you're doing is you're acting on the basis of your imagined, already preconceived response. So really. Part of the real amazing power and of the simplicity of self-inquiry is that it's a pathway to realism. You actually start to experience just as what is right in front of you. And what is right in front of you is so rich and so beautiful and so dynamic and has so many more details and features than you could ever kind of anticipate in advance that you find that just staying in this state of stillness and allowing the response to emerge from you in response to the other is this glorious and beautiful dance. And that any kind of strategic anticipation of what you're going to say and then what he's going to say and what she's going to say is just hopelessly, you know, uh, imagine it's imaginary. Um, whereas being in present moment is incredibly powerful. In, in, for all the reasons that you're kind of anticipating future conversations. We, we have some videos on now, now, now. I mean, now is not just, you know, it's the passage between past going to future. There is something we've said before, incredibly powerful and different about being in the present. It isn't like be here now, which is really you doing something to not be in now, pulls you out of now. But it gets so seductive to be in now the brain supports this the brain likes this now 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 thing it doesn't like to be fantasizing about the future or worried about the past which is past after all it wants to be now and it loves that and if you can get enough examples of being in now it will neurochemically endogenously support that it will develop it, use its own chemicals to make you stay in now, and you will have a very difficult time, turns out, moving out of it. Because the brain loves this space. It does not want to go into, oh, what I want, when I see Susie, what am I going to say to her? I'm going to tell my boss this next time I see her. That is so uh, less pleasurable than being in now. Now is so much more beautiful than fantasizing about what I might say to my boss next time I see her. This, this doesn't even compare. The good news, Mark, though, is, is that this observing is happening, right? That you're seeing it. And so just by observing it, eventually it just starts to you know, kind of dwindle. And it doesn't happen so much because you see yourself doing it. Um, and then what happens is every now and then you see yourself doing that, and it's kind of funny. Say, oh, what, you know, what do I possibly hope to do by, you know, imagining what those uh what this future conversation is going to be uh and then i often find myself saying you know quoting rupaul you know she says what other people think of me is none of my business you know uh and so you you, you stop spending all that bandwidth anticipating this imaginary conversation and it's much sweeter place to be and again you'll always be wrong you yes. have no idea what the other person is going to think when they come to you what their state of mind is going to be, what they had happened to them that morning, 
and what they ate that morning, how tired they are. You have no clue how they're going to show up. So to imagine you could forecast that ahead of time, days ahead of time, it's absurd. It just isn't going to work. Especially since they're probably doing it too. They're, doing it. <laughs> they're forecasting your behavior. You know, and they don't know you, you either. So there's just no chance you can forecast those things around. Yeah, Mark uh, replied here, I've had a little improv experience and it makes sense. When I prepare, I fail. When yeah. I free my mind, I can be more in the scene. Exactly. Yeah, well, it's all improv. I had my right hand, uh, one of the great improv teachers. I mean, he really does uh, fantastic lectures of a very complicated nature, impromptu, uh, with such elegance and sophistication, it's so hard to imagine. I mean, just... Totally impromptu, nothing prepared. Eckhart Tolle's puzzle works the same way. There is no prep. You just walk in and you begin letting whatever is inside you flow out after you prepare it. My esteemed spontaneous colleague. Yeah, it's true. I never would have thought it was possible. I always over prepared and I would step on my own students' responses and I would get angry that a class wasn't going along the way that I had prepared it to go uh, because I had imagined what the responses would be and so forth. But if I just go and I'm in source and of course I've done the reading that we are to discuss or the topic that we're to discuss and then we discuss and it's just so much more beautiful and, and dynamic. So there's a little bit of preparation obviously you're not just you know showing up having not read anything like that's part of just no I've got 51 now years of reading well. yeah or you know 47 <laughs> years of reading so but but no, but there's no preparation in terms of I'm not thinking like, OK, I'm going to start with this. And so literally I go in, I go to the board, I write three letter numbers on the board and then whatever comes out, number one, whatever comes out, number two, whatever comes out, number three. There's no. Uh, there's there's no planning. And we have some good research on this last year. There was a good paper done in Scandinavia and just demonstrating clearly you don't think up what you say. I mean, if you just watch yourself speaking, you don't think of what you say anyway. All you do is you're running a parallel imaginary tract up here, and what comes out is something totally different. I mean, it just isn't credible. If you watch carefully, and the experiment shows this, you don't have any idea what you're saying until after it's said, and you hear it being said, and then you play it back to yourself. You don't know what came out. And so you should just... You know, cut yourself some slack and recognize, you know, read the information and then let it come out. Just trust what comes out because you have no alternative. You can't think it up anyway. It's just coming out faster than you can possibly think up the words you're going to say. And the really weird thing is, I will say, the weird thing is, is that you say, oh, you know, you've done reading. Yeah, but it can be something that I haven't read in years. And something comes out of it that I didn't even with my conscious mind notice when I first read it and then I'll talk about it and sure enough it's in there because as Gary has talked many times is that our conscious awareness is so tiny compared to the massive parallel processor that each of us has up here that if we get out of the way like it accesses its archives and its databases in a much more you know robust way than if we, you know, try to direct it from our conscious awareness. So I'm constantly amazed at just like how well everything works out in terms of, you know, I'll just say, oh, well, you know, maybe we'll read this next. And then it works perfectly. And I have no idea. It's just a feeling. I know it sounds irresponsible, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, you know, I think it's, I think, I, I feel like I've seen it in action a little bit and it's amazing. So, um, and, I, and I, you know, from and personal it's not experience. Me. Yeah. Who is so? If I ask, who is it? Yeah. Valus. <laughs> Valus. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But, but, but to Richard's point, I mean, yeah. we we have this comparison between what is our conscious uh, parallel, our conscious processor. It can handle seven plus or minus two data set data pieces at a time. It can solve one problem. Offline, we have one of the wonders of the universe. I mean, huge, 100 billion plus neurons, trillions of synaptic interconnections, tens of trillions. I mean, to believe that you can't do a better job in this little tiny seven plus or minus two things that can solve one problem at a time poorly. 
Underneath that is this massive parallel processor, and we use the metaphor of this rider on an elephant, except the rider is tiny, and the elephant is like gargantua elephant. Um, you've got to get this little thing out of the way. It's going, yee, 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 and just listen to what comes up. Give bandwidth and space for let the big elephant come out and give you the answer. Or it's like we've got this little abacus up here, and then back here is the supercomputer. You know, right. <laughs> you're like well, the abacus is saying, "Wait, let me. I'm going to figure this out. I'm so glad I figured this out." Like, no, just let the supercomputer take over. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, great. Well, I have, an, I have another question from Esteban here, um, and he asks, which apps, video games, or educational software could you recommend, if any, for increasing spontaneous, effortless action or restful yet energetic ways of being? How can any of these tech tools help to make training the mind-brain feel effortless? Mm -hmm. we, there are a lot of apps uh, that you can have reminder apps. And you can use those throughout the course of the day if you can randomize them or even set a time and have them just pop up with, where am I, throughout the course of the day. And every time it pops up, just take, you know, 30 seconds and look at this question. Where am I? When am I? What is this? That's enough to, to give yourself a very high data value uh, point. Because the brain is going, rrr, 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 and now you stop. Maybe just for 30 seconds, and you get an open window, and the brain sees that. And the brain can extract great value out of that big difference in contrast. On another note, you know, the, this work that we did at Yale over the course of several years with fMRI to actually watch in real time uh, the selfie network, the eye meaning mind network, shut down or activate, and the condition in which that took place. Unfortunately, fMRI costs about a million dollars a Tesla. The average uh, fMRI is like three Teslas, three million dollars, not going to be in your basement probably. So we're working on an EEG, uh, which is just on the outside of the head, like a, a diving cap, but it has lots of little transducers in it. And if we can locate those in the right places around the outside of the skull, and we can data process out the interference with all those stuff that's in between here and down in here where the real big center is, then you can get a very cheap, less than hundred thousand, less than hundred thousand dollars, certainly less than a thousand dollars, maybe a few hundred dollars. Uh, there's a lot of effort going into this now. We have uh, transducer, we have headsets out now that have 40 transducers, which is all that you need. It's just a question of taking the ones that are on the market now for like three hundred and fifty dollars and getting the price down a little bit more. And then putting them over the right sites. We know exactly what sites are that will give us a proxy for this very deep in the center site. So we can do this. It's very close at hand, six months, nine months, a year. You'll be able to just uh, USB plug in or maybe even wireless um, sit there and watch your brain in action going in and out of cell phone. And when you have that, you'll be able to really train yourself, have your brain train itself. On exactly how to shut down this I mean my network. That's very close at hand. I would also say in the meantime, use the inner app, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, like Gary was saying, use the reminder app to remind you to do self inquiry. And you can, I uh, have always found uh, Japam internal chanting all day to be very useful because it crowds out any other thoughts. So, uh, so it's, you know, cause you asked about being effortless. I find myself, as soon as I get on a bicycle, the chant already starts internally. It's happening. As soon as I step onto the pool deck where I swim, the chant automatically happens. As soon as I walk into a classroom, the chant automatically happens. So you can start out using the app on your phone to remind you to say, do self inquiry or to chant. Um, but, what happens is eventually you become, you know, cued by the routine and your environment so that it just starts happening. It's really quite amazing to watch as it just occurs. You know, there's even a very particular spot, like right on my bicycle route where different kinds of just utterances come out of my mouth automatically. And every time I just watch it happen and I can't believe it. So it becomes effortless after you practice for a while. 
Yeah, we, we also have one of the great DIY indicators already installed. So we're just talking about the internal stuff. This self-referential internal narrative, which we know what centers generate this thing, is sitting there. That's a perfect indicator of I, me, mine, of self. If it's going blah, 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 and you watch it, and you can step back and watch it, you can see exactly just where you are in your progress as far as getting rid of the I. If it's going zoom a million miles a minute, a lot of stuff hooked together, thoughts never ending, spiraling out of control, big tornadic energies taking place, then you've got a lot of work to do. If you can do your self inquiry, you can inquire, 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 you can watch that start to break down the structure of those thoughts. Instead of being zoom, let me be then they get longer spaces between them. They won't be as sticky, they won't be as energetic, they won't be as prone to cause enormous problems, giving you turning pain into suffering. You can just watch your progress by watching what's happening to your internal nerve. The best indicator in the galaxy for where you are on getting rid of the eye of the There's none better. With the neuroscience we're doing, we'll be able to show you look at that same center, making that narrative. But the narrative is the best indicator you can find of where you are in getting rid of your suffering, getting rid of your self-referential narrative. That's where the I and mean, my lives. Great, thank you. Wow, um, it's amazing that that's coming up. Uh, to be able to watch that. Um, <laughs> there goes my productivity. It's also very low cost. <laughs> yeah, she's no, thinking about the the the, the cap. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that'll be cool for sure. But it's it's just like you know what Mark was talking about, where he's able to watch his future conversations come up in his mind. That means he's already operating that app, right? Okay. And so you, you can always just do that. And, you, and it's amazing because you watch it and you know exactly. And you just say, where is that coming from? Who's adding that? And you watch it. Who sent you? <laughs> you know, it's another one. And it goes away. And, and after a while, you're just always monitoring whether there's something there or not. And it sounds wearying, but it's not. It's the opposite of wearying. It's just, it's like breathing. There's a lot of money going into this, too. The Department of Defense, DARPA, is also putting money into this, lots of it, try to get the cost down. What they're looking for is for PTSD. They want something they can give to returning injured uh, vets and say, look, here's a something you can plug into your laptop and uh, you can get rid of your PTSD by doing the following protocols. So there's a lot of people seeing a lot of uh, good interest in this thing for all the right reasons. Interesting. Wow. Um... Cool. I have a question from Fareed, uh, and he asks, so is the brain working with, ins with its environment without us, so we are just not really making decisions, or is that not the case? Yeah, you aren't making, you aren't necessary at all. <laughs> the basic way you are is a piece of software, and, and the brain doesn't really need this software. As you probably heard before, roughly 75,000 years ago, our species developed this piece of software this I, me, my software. Uh, as we got into agriculture and large organizations, our populations got larger and larger, more and more people coming along. We had to have different task assignments, different functionalities. So we had to some, have some way to say, well, you're supposed to be the one, you know, you go out and kill the soil, you plant the seeds, you harvest. And to do that, we had to be able to communicate in complicated ways. So we developed symbolic logic, we developed languages, no languages or I, me, my, doing something to this object. It just came online. It was very useful for quite a while. But if you watch in first year average day, it goes on. This narrative goes on all day long about nothing at all of any merit. It just goes blah, 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 blah all day long. And so arguably, this is my, one of my pieces, is that you can displace it. I mean, that is... Gen 1, that's you know, OS 1, and we now have to step into OS 1 beta or OS 2 to get something that doesn't have this terribly annoying, uh, energy draining, bandwidth consuming, anxiety causing internal narrative. You don't need it. You can really run without it. Most of, my, most of the time, my brain is very quiet. Still, nothing's going on, and yet I can still work in the world. You don't need that. The different brain, the different brain circuits. There's a neural circuit that does the IMI, 
is a neural circuit that does all the tasking, planning, problem solving. Different circuits. Completed circuits. Command and control circuit, another third neural circuit. But this blah, blah, blah network is not required. You don't need it. And, and by that, to follow up, Fareed, by that he means, Gary means that uh, the part of the circuit, you know, that thinks that it's making decisions is not needed. Right, that it's just, it's trying to desperately make a story out of the world by claiming to have made a decision. Uh, but it's, it's, it's that part that we said, remember before, which can only work on one problem at a time. And so it constantly feels frustrated because there's way more decisions to be made than just one problem at a time. And of course, we're not stymied by that. We still make our way through the world. But there's this kind of need to feel like we're kind of like running the puppet show when in fact we're not, we're no more running the puppet show than any of the rest of nature of which we are a part is running a puppet show. We feel comfortable looking at it in nature and it even feels good to see that, wow, it's just all happening. You know, there's nobody's doing it. It just happens. The snow just falls off the tree. The, the creek just uh, flows in, it, in the way it flows. But for somehow because of this uh, internal self-referential narrative and language that uses subject and object and separates us from nature we think like well that's all very well and good for nature but everything i do has to happen on purpose <laughs> as opposed to realizing that, like no i'm i'm manifesting and 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 ongoing in the same way that the rest of nature is there's no doer here any more than there's a doer in the bonsai tree on the uh, image right there it's just a manifestation of beautiful interrelations of thermodynamics and biology that is miraculous and beautiful and, and, and worthy of all kinds of, uh, you know, reverence, but there's no doer there. Yeah, for if you watch very carefully when you make a decision, when you seemingly make a decision, just, you know, they have this internal going back and forth, well, we could do this, we could do this, but then this might happen and that might happen. And never ending going back and forth, looking at the, all the possible choices, what's going to go on. If you watch very carefully when that decision is made, you'll find it had nothing to do with that narrative. It comes out of no place. The brain, no place being the brain. The main part of the brain, the elephant, has made a decision. And it pops up the answer. You come in then later and you explain to others, well, why did you make that decision? Why did you choose that car, not that. Well, here's the uh, well, here's the reason. Oh, well, the transmission. Yeah, and you, and you begin to create a story about why that choice was made. It wasn't the reason you made the choice. The choice was made offline. It just popped up in. That was the decision. Bang, the brain made the decision, and you came in later to try to explain it. The rider on the elephant, the press secretary, came in later and tried to say, "Well, what the what, what the brain really did here was it isn't that how it is not happens. You don't." Make the choices. The choices happen all by themselves. And again, I want to say that that sometimes that can sound because we have such a strong impression that there is a doer here doing something, just as we have a strong impression that the sun rises and sets rather than the earth going around the sun, or that the horizon really is where the sky meets, uh, you know, the earth. That it can seem like that's a loss of something to say that there's no doer there, but. Again, this is why, you know, if, if we're lucky enough to, you know, view a supernova where we can experience like that supernova just is, it's just happening. There's no doer there doing that. And, you know, you're a supernova, you know, you're a supernova of neuroscience that's happening at all times, but there's no doer governing it any more than there's a doer governing uh, the supernova. Yeah, a lot of this goes right back believing if you have a choice, you believe you have a free will, and you believe you can be in control. There's nothing to support that. I mean, if you, if you if you watch the course of your day, life, whatever, you will find that you are not in control. You, you believe you've got control, but if you watch carefully, I think this is why we have so much anxiety. We think we should be able to be in control, and yet we have this very limited processor we talked about before, this conscious processor totally incapable of grasping the massive interconnected complexity of our world. You just can't possibly make a logical, intelligent decision. There's just too much information, stuff's happening too fast. Through the tiny little processor, you can't possibly handle the data. And so we know that we're not in control. We can see we make plans, but plans never come out. 
We keep failing. We keep trying. We keep thinking, telling ourselves, oh, you didn't work hard enough. You should have thought more. You could have read more. Should have booked a different should flight. Should have booked a different flight, whatever. But in fact, it's out of your control. I mean, it's totally out of your control. What choices you think you make are meaningless because you have no idea what's going to happen in your world. As I ask people, if you think you're in control and you have free will, how's that working out for you? I mean, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And that's why we're so deeply frustrated. We cannot be in control. We refuse to accept that. But it is, as Rich said, it's one of the sweetest places you can imagine. I would thought I'd be terrified if I lost my free will, if I lost my ability to be in control. And yet when it happened, it was like the best news you could imagine. You're so much relieved of the blaming yourself for what went wrong in the past, that the responsibility that you couldn't possibly do anything anyway go away. You find yourself in this beautiful dance that goes on all by itself without any engagement from an eye doing something. And and the sense of separation that you have from that dance goes away. So for example, you look back to you know the story in Genesis, you know, and Eve and Adam have all the fruits that they can eat and they say uh, I want this one, not that one. You know, like our sense that we want this and I don't want that goes along with that sense of being in control. Whereas if we just can get to the place where we accept what is, that sense of separation disappears and we feel ourselves a part of this really beautiful and miraculous unfolding where, you know, things come into being and go out of being. And some of them have the characteristic of anger. Some of them have the characteristic of joy, but they're all part of what is. The problem is not the anger or the joy. The problem is our attachment or resistance to the anger and the joy. Wow. Uh, lots of comments in the, the chat about this. Um, of course. So <laughs> Fareed, Fareed mentioned, so the mind is really working from our unconscious. That's... Is that something you would agree with, or well, the, the, the mind? Mind to me is a dangerous word. I mean, it, mind. Most of the teachings that I've come across in my experience, the mind is just a collection of thoughts. I mean, there is no mind per se. There's just a collection of thoughts. The brain's cranking out. We don't have a mind. I mean, it's an inconvenience to talk about it, but it's not really a real thing. I mean, the brain is doing this all by itself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. The, so so Mark um, mentioned. So is the software like an agent that sits on top of the operating system for menial tasks that require communication? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Well said, Mark. Well said. It's this press secretary, communicator, press secretary. Uh, the, the big elephant underneath couldn't possibly speak to another person because there's so much information down there. And I think the reason we developed this little tiny writer and this huge elephant is because if you had all this processing capability on your desktop running, metaphorically, and a tiger came running towards you, a lion came running towards you at the watering hole, you'd be running 83 programs. And you wouldn't have any capability to respond in time before the, the lion ate you. And so we developed this little tiny process of us as well, what's going to look for the look for the line to come and get out of the way. That's the only way you could run this enormous processor, get it through the press secretary, and still survive the lines. But over time the press secretary became convinced that it was president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, and, and and what's interesting is an inter interesting hack can be is that because sometimes when our press secretary hears that, it gets frightened, it resists it. Oh, that can't be so. I'm in control, you know. So what I actually found was very useful at a certain point was I gave, you know, my my ego a job. I gave it the job of being executive vice president of neurodynamic inventory and control, where its job was to take any internal self-referential narrative thought and return it to its source. And so, I mean, it got a soft landing. It got an easy retirement and had a company car for a while, you know, and had all kinds of perks. And so you don't need to, uh, you know, use terms like ego death and so forth around it necessarily because it can become frightened. But it's really, uh, as Mark's label for it indicates, it's not a very important 
part of our process, but evolutionarily we become convinced that it is like who we are. Um, so as Gary was pointing to, we're at a stage now where evolution can take place within the realm of consciousness, right? In other words, we don't need to alter our biological phenotype, even though we are with technology and so forth. Uh, the important step to take now is to alter that sense of the agent, that software agent, which is sitting on top and shift from a sense of separate discrete identity to field of awareness engaged in this ongoing process of evolution. And, you know, it feels good. Very cool. I'm just uh, trying to take notes and do the moderation at the same time, <laughs> uh, which is uh, proving well, difficult. Something but, else too is that the common report is people get further and further along this path and they start deconstructing this uh, software, breaking down the algorithm and questioning its integrity. Is it true? Is it real? Is it useful? Is it helping me or is it hurting me? Do I need this app? Do I need this app? Yeah. And they find out that, in fact, they look at that and say, well, you know, I don't think I need this app. And eventually they say, well, you know, I've noticed, in fact, I can see I'm not in control of this awakening process. There's something the brain is taking over <laughs> now. It. And the brain is just to say, you know, we don't need this app. Let's just chuck the app and see if we can run without it. And you find out you try more and more and more. They go more and more and more. You find out that, in fact, the brain doesn't need this app. It just doesn't need it. Communication when you say things and stuff, press secretary, but it doesn't need to run the app. And it's pretty remarkable because I can report that, you know, it seems like, oh, well, you know, aren't you going to have to plan out, you know, your life and how to be here and meet this person then and get the space time coordinates right and so forth. But what's totally unbelievable is that the more you let go, the more that seems to just be taken care of by the cosmos itself insofar as we're, we, you form a continuity with the cosmos. You get in harmony with the Tao, as the Tao Te Ching says it. And so you're just always at the right place in the right time. And there it is. The person you needed to meet is right there. There's the person that you need, needed to meet over there. Oh, here's the plane. Here's the train. Here's the car. Uh, and, and the decisions, which formerly had been sort of cognitive affairs, is like, well, I don't know, maybe on the one hand, maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that. Instead, you just sort of surf along on a sense of what feels right. And you have to be careful about how you talk about that to other people because then other people think it's a little nutty. But you just do what feels right. And what feels right turns out to have been the best quote unquote decision because you're not getting in there with the software agent saying, well, you know, I know it feels right to do this. But if you look at the pros and cons, you really ought to do this. But in fact, the feeling is an unerring guide. To what is to be done if you can stay in contact with that feeling. Yeah, and there are so many, as Richie indicated in my life, and for Richie's too, oh, I know this. There's so many serendipities that occur. I mean, so many uh, um, almost unbelievably uh, improbable events and correspondences of several people meeting at the right time to do exactly the right thing. You could never have imagined you could even possibly even conceive of how to organize something like that. And then somehow it magically happens, quote, all by itself. You just get out of the way, let go of the delusion that you need this software package, right? And let go of the idea that you're something different and just see what the universe does with that. I was amazed when the, the thing fell away and my thoughts stopped that, my gosh, my life went along all by itself, even better than before. Well, why was I stressed out all the time? Well, and, you know, people talk about ayahuasca, for example, sometimes as the synchronicity brew. And this was definitely one of the kind of like most like remarkable, miraculous characteristics of it for me. But given this framework, it makes sense because it induces a, a silencing of this self-referential thought, at least for a while. And when you silence the self-referential thought and stop trying to get in there and make all the decisions for the cosmos, Cosmos is arranging everything and you say, oh, my gosh, look at how that worked out, which, of course, is how I ended up drinking ayahuasca in the first place. In fact, the very first thing that the ayahuasca voice said to me when I drank was, I, as I said, oh, my God, what have I done? I'm down here in my jungle, my, in the jungle, my kids back home. You know, what am I doing? And it said, you didn't think this was your idea, did you? <laughs> so and of course, it wasn't. 
but the rider on top of the elephant thought it was steering the elephant. And, you know, it gets very frustrated when the elephant won't go in the right way. So the more you can let go, the more everything really is self-organizing. That's how you got here in the first place. That's beautiful. <laughs> Love that. Um, I have a, a kind of follow-up question, and I, these questions are great. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah, you for reading for that one. Um, yes. And Ivan asks, so if we're never – if we are never really in control of our lives, then are we also spectators to disaster, addictions, and misfortune as well? There is a darker side to no free will, but maybe this darker side is just more ego trying to resist. Indeed. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 yes, I mean, there's no, there is no, you can argue about this or not. And many people have a very difficult time with the no free will thing. I mean, with all the videos we have, nothing gets more attractive, more views than the no free world things. People fight against it, they argue about it, they get angry, they get hostile, they get shouted at. Whether you like it or not, you don't have it. I mean, we have the neuroscience to prove to you that you don't have free will. There's a question of belief. You just don't have it. And so whether you accommodate the calamities or not, it doesn't matter. They're going to happen. And you have no control over them. If you're part of them, then you're part of them. But you don't have free will. This is scientifically demonstrable you don't have free will so just get over it but but also i mean in terms of you know the spectator to disaster part um you know if you look carefully at these disasters you know if you look at you know what the nature of uh our kind of many of our contemporary impasses are they're caused precisely by the illusion of being able to fix things in other words that it may indeed be out of our control for many of us to have this very deep impression that we are in control. And then when we have this deep impression that we are in control, we try to foist that control onto the world. And when we foist onto that control onto the world, we do things like use poison gas. We do things like fly airplanes into the ground, you know? So, I think that rather than thinking that we're like we're going to become spectators on disaster, I think we become part of the solution to what is really the epidemic, the illness. The illness is ego. But I think as the end of your question indicated, you know, is this just ego? Ego says, oh, yeah, well, how are you going to fix the world then? It's like, well, we're going to fix the world by stop trying to fix the world. It's the attempt to fix the world that creates most of these uh Disasters. And those attempts, of course, themselves are a manifestation, you know, just like the supernova. But what's interesting is, is that consciousness actually can experience more freedom, freedom from this delusion that it is in control. And as it experiences that, it tends to wither these kinds of activities of, you know, thrashing around, wheel spinning, which results in so much violence and, you know, the aforementioned disaster. So, I don't think it's so much that you then are somehow, okay, I'm just checked out now and I'm just going to look on bemused as the world burns. But in fact, you kind of actively contribute through this work to putting out a lot of the world's fires because most of the world's fires are self-inflicted by this refusal to acknowledge the fact that we're all part of this interconnected network, which can't possibly be in control of itself. And that's the whole idea behind this new operating system. You've got, we've got to somehow, as a species, wind down this ego, crank it down several notches so it isn't running the mess we have around us. I mean, anybody logs on, I'll say they've been asleep for the last 50 years, log on, look at what's going on today, and see, ask yourself, wouldn't this be better if we didn't have egos involved? I mean, how could it be any worse than what's going on right now? I mean, it, it, we've got to somehow do something about this thing, or we are in serious trouble. Right. Is it absence of ego that's causing structural inequality? I don't think so. You know, is it absence of ego that's causing massive consumption and, you know, environmental degradation as a result to no effect of happiness, right? You know, happiness can't be found on that route. So it's not. No, it, it's it. this, you know, it would be interesting to try to quantify and monetize the sheer cost and footprint of egoic consciousness on the planet. Because I think once you started to do it, you would see that it's a massive epidemic. And rather than thinking that, you know, 
we're going to become kind of, you know, uncaring bodhisattvas that are dwelling in caves and like, you know, chuckling over the latest misfortunes of the poor mortals. Instead, we become actually part of the solution. I think it's significant that the two most uh, successful political movements for social change that I can think of in the 20th century anyway, the civil rights movement in the United States and the anti-colonial movement in India, both were powered by this spirit of agape, of selflessness, of the dwindling of ego. And unlike, you know, armed insurrection and, you know, egoic uh, control, we're successful. Yeah, if you look at the massive disproportionation of wealth in this country, but all over the world, I mean, the top 1%, tenth of a percent, have huge, vastly uh, disparate resources compared to the rest of the population. I mean, that's something like, what, 80 people have as much money as the other half, the lowest half of the people. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, this is just ego run amok. We've got to find some way to, we have enough wealth, we just have to share it more proportionately. So the answer is no, we shine the light of consciousness on this darkness, um, which you point to, and we don't, we're not simply spectators to it, but by taking care of our own internal self-referential narrative thought, we collectively dwindle the planetary egoic investment. Ivan says uh, that that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and uh, Fareed mentioned, so what you are saying is that we are failures as a species because our only and main purpose is to control our environment, which is kind of an interesting Well, point. and there is, there is a quote from Buckminster Fuller, too. You must remember we are not nature's only experiment. I mean, there's no stone tablet in place that says that, that our species has to survive. Maybe we're not going to make it. Maybe we just uh, run amok with this, this egoic consciousness, and if we can't unwind it or somehow get a whole new way of operating, I don't think we're going to last much longer. There are futurists who will say two more generations. That's what we got. And I don't think we're going to fix it fast enough. Well, I, I remain more optimistic about that, but I also remain, I, I also would contest, I like Farid's point, but uh, I think next to this idea that, you know, the purpose of the species is to control its environment, I think the uh, Carl Sagan saying is much more appropriate, which is that we are a way for the cosmos to know itself and that, you know, our real destiny and purpose is to become self-aware. And so in that sense, I, I wouldn't say that we're either a failure or a success yet, but insofar as we're going to survive, apropos of what Gary is saying, I think that self-awareness is the way to do that. Yeah, I would say we, to, we, we try to control our environment, but evolution is about adapting to your environment. Mm -hmm. It isn't about dominating your environment or making it conform to you. And that's what you know the brain keeps doing. The brain keeps trying to adapt to the changing environment. I mean, there is to the pieces we put forth about you know the Higgs field penetrates everything. It penetrates all of us. We don't know if the Higgs field is conscious or not, or self-conscious or super intelligent. If it's it's at least as intelligent as we are, because it couldn't, we are it, it is us, so we couldn't have properties it doesn't have. So it's at least that intelligent. And maybe this is just the, as quote Carl Sagan, this is just the universe knowing itself. And the universe is, is evolving, and everything in it's evolving, so it's kind of nonsensical to believe that it wouldn't be evolving as well. So it's all evolving along, adapting to the changing environment as it does modify. I think we are just the sock puppets for the universe. And our job is to do our evolutionary part, adapt as fast as we can, and let the universe adapt along with this thing as the environment changes. And part of that adaptation is to realize that we're not separate from the environment and we're not in control of it. Great answers. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question from Joeri. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, uh, I have a question. Are there any downsides to non-dual awakening? Don't think so. <laughs> well, if, 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 you're, if you're attached, uh, some of your attachments, you will lose attachment to. That's your problem. That's 
uh, a downside. I don't. I didn't find it to be a downside. But one of the things that uh, we often do when working with people is to look at our attachments and to let go of our attachment. Doesn't mean that things have to go away. You don't have to throw away your car and your dog and your kids and your partner, whatever. You just have to feel what your attachment is to those and see if you could just let go of the attachment. Now, as Rich indicated earlier, this, this is this is a, a hard thing to get your hands around. You know what? Who's going to take care of them? But my experience is that you find you're actually a better worker, provider, husband, father, because you don't have an agenda and you don't have a storyline that your kids or your wife or your boss or your job has to conform to. When you just let go of your attachment to it, you function at a whole different, much higher, much more present now, now, now level. Things work better and you're much more efficient and effective in doing that. So if you love your attachments, just question, could I let go of them? Take something very simple, some easy little attachment, and see if I could let go of this little attachment. And feel it. Feel when it's there, feel when it's gone. Feel when it's there, feel when it's gone. And see how, just how much you're attached to it. And ask yourself, could I let go of this thing? We have this Sedona method and the Byron Katie method. You can, amazingly, if you feel this attachment, you can just let go of it. Hard to imagine, hard to believe. You can just let go of the attachment. And it goes away. It's only there because you're hanging on to it. You believe it has some protective value. Some story has a protective value for you. Maybe 30 years ago. It has no value whatsoever. You're just hanging on to it. You can let go of those. You can just let go of those. I'm still thinking I I, I don't, I, I can't inventory any downsides in my own experience. Um, it's, it's more like a recognition of what has always been there and experiencing what has always been there. Um, the world certainly seems very strange and funny, uh, if that counts as a downside. It seems very uh, odd. It's it's hard to. It sometimes I feel like I speak Martian because uh, the premises that I have, the pre the understanding I have of the way in which things are operating, are so at odds with the way in which you know some of the people in my life operate. But um, once I was able to let go of the need to, uh, you know, tell them what those premises were, you know, to sort of convert them, to make them non-dual, right, then everything just seems actually perfect. And they actually seem to tune a little bit to this other way of being. And it makes everything a little bit much more copacetic and, and uh and beautiful. So no, I, I mean, this is the pro here are the problems with non-dual experience. It's too simple, and it seems too good to be true. So this means that you know it's hard to accept. But in fact, it's very simple. It is as good uh, as you know is being said for this experience. So um, uh, I can't um, find any any downsides, and it just is what is. Yeah, we also did some surveys on people who compared typical growth of pleasure for sex, drugs, and non-duality. And non-duality wins because it has uh, no downside. And I think we've all been through, uh, I don't know if you psychedelic, but certainly sex. And, you know, Pleasurable, but not as pleasurable as this non dual state is, this persistent non dual state is. And uh, OMG, there's a lot of downsides to sex. I think we've all been to that dance. So, you know, you've got something that's better than sex and doesn't have the downsides. That seems like a winning combination to me. If it were a drug, <laughs> you, everyone would be chasing it. Yeah. Like, because we understand in our culture that drugs can produce these effects, and so then you use them and you get that effect and you say, oh, that's really good. But because it requires this just this use of the what we call the internal app, just this turning of the mind around on itself and practicing that, we don't really have a cultural place to put that. There's no, there's no gizmo for it. There's no drug for it. 
So it seems to be so good to be true. But if it were a drug, I guarantee you it would be the most popular drug that existed because there's no body load. There's no downside. It's not addiction. It's anti-craving. You lose your craving for anything. <laughs> so I'm not sure drugs. Oh, no, pleasure, enjoyment is, spikes through the roof. Uh, everything smells more intensely, tastes more intensely. Uh, experience itself is d deeply enriched by this experience. Again, if it makes sense, because you don't have that radio broadcast going on up there jamming your actual experience of this beautiful reality that we've been born into. So you're experiencing the reality that you've evolved in and that's what you're here for. So um, I think the, the the barriers that we have towards kind of like this kind of mode of awareness really going viral, as it were, is really just that we don't have a category to put it in. Is it a religion? Is it a drug? Is it a technology? It's none of those things. It's brain hacking. Right? We're taking our own awareness. We're turning it on our own consciousness and we're evolving. Yeah, there is some there is some hope too, Jeremy. Um, I'm working almost every day now with a guy out in Silicon Valley, in Palo Alto, who is thinks this is the next thing. I mean, mindfulness five years ago was nothing. It was really you know a tiny group of people doing it. Now it's going viral. Mindfulness is everywhere from nothing five years ago, and people now are looking at what's the next thing. And it looks like this could be the next thing. And people who are seeing what we're talking about, these guys that I talk to, and I start with them weekly now, uh, th th they found money in the Valley. This one guy quit his job at Twitter, big six-figure job at Twitter, just to focus on getting a company started to work on non-duality. I mean, this, they think, could be the next thing. And as Rich says, I think it could be so fantastic if it took off that way. That's the thing I think we can hope for. That in fact, this may go viral. If it does, it is such a sweet thing. It's hard to imagine why it would stop. The institutions aren't going to much care for this thing. Religions aren't going to much care for this thing. But it is so seductive and so rich and sweet that it may just go viral. People are people are starting to bet money on it. He's telling me he can get all the money he can put his hands on if he wants to move this thing forward. We'll see. A couple years ago, uh in response to Raymond Kurzweil's uh, book, The Singularity is Near, right, where there's this idea that technology reaches some sort of critical point, tipping point, where essentially, you know, transformation of the human species takes place. Uh, I wrote in response that the singularity is within you. And I think that what Gary is pointing to here is this, that the next big thing really is right on your shoulders and you already have the method for working on it. There's ways in which we can get better at it and, and get uh, good at visualizing it and making it available to more people. But I, I really do think that once you think about it, it's the next frontier, our own internal awareness that has been being blocked by this little egoic, agential evolutionary being that has outlived his usefulness and has become a toxic you know, essentially plague upon the planet. Wow, awesome. Uh, what a great way of putting it, the viral the viral uh, cure for the plague. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, super cool. Uh, do we have time for one more question, guys? I think we I think we do, sure. if, you're, if you're okay with it. Um, and that was Yuri, by the way. I had, Thank you, Yuri. I, I messed up the name, uh, pronouncing their names, so apologies for that, but thank you for the great question. And Michael has a question here. Um, for the past month or so, I've been flooded with memories of defining moments from all stages of life. Some happy, some sad, some triumphs, some failures. The underlying sense is that it is time to say goodbye to all this stuff. What's going on? Say goodbye to them. I mean, I guess it, it happens when the brain goes around, the brain's very parsimonious, this real estate and the brain goes around and looks for places that haven't been used for a while. And so all these old stories, old memories, you said a long time ago took place, they pop up. And so the question is, do you want to take delivery? Michael, right? Do you want, do you want to take delivery on these things? 
and they pop up and you say, I don't care about that. Then it goes back in the UPS truck and goes away. I mean, it just goes away. And just let those things come up, be present for them, let them come in, see if you want to keep them. If you don't, just say, no, I don't care about that thing, and let go of it. And you can clean those up. They're of no value. They're old stories. They're no longer useful for you to protect you from harm in the future. It doesn't make any difference anymore. Just let go of them. They're not you. They're just their, your idea of you. And I know it can be very well overwhelming. I've gone through periods like this myself where in a short period of time, wow, a whole bunch of them are released. And it can be tempting to think like, okay, I've got to work through those. Like, no, you don't. It doesn't matter what the content of them is. They're like Some of them seem like they're worse and some seem better and so forth. But they're all just traces of a past that is not you and you let them go. They don't need to be worked through. If you if you try to work through them, that could take the, that would take the rest of your life. And that's the sort of egoic gamble. Like the ego says, "Oh, well, you need to work through this. You need to find out who you really are. You need to know your story." It's like, no, you just need to know that it is a story, <laughs> and let it go. And you can feel as you let each one of these memories. Like, is it important? You know. Uh, as you let them go, it's it's it is it's a kind of bittersweetness. You feel it go, and and you say goodbye. Um, I had one just yesterday. The, the word dimension popped out, and I realized, oh, my brother, you know, who I've been mourning for, you know, uh, twenty four years or you know something. He was a member of some group called Dimension, and. It was a youth group devoted to Christianity or something, which I never even, like, really? I, I forgot this completely. It was buried down deep in there. And it's tempting to say, aha, you know, that is the key to who I am and who he was. No, it was just this thing that happened. Yeah. And then it goes away. And so, like, for example, around here right now, there's still little patches of snow here and there where it's shaded during the day. And in my experience, that's what happens is that over time, it's like the big patches then clear out. And then there's little holdouts here. And then every now and then you get a little patch of snow that you come up with, a little memory that comes up. And it's it's nothing, you know, it's just, and the more you let go of those, the more you experience where you are right now, right? Rather than who you think you are and what you think was important about the past and why you're so, you know, why the present is so impossible. It's not impossible. It's right here. And as that fades away, the, the clarity and the, the intensity and the radiance of this present moment shines through because you're not dulling it with all of this like, well, yeah, I'd really love to be able to experience this present moment. But you see, there's all these scarring things from my past. And it's just like, well, but the present moment doesn't care about any of those things because it's now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael says, thank you. Um, you know, I'm tempted to ask like a follow up about the difference yeah. between accepting, you know, part of mm -hmm. yourself and I guess letting go of it. You know, we're kind of trained to think you have to accept the parts that you don't like about yourself. But in a way, you're just saying accept and let go. It's not accept and right. keep around. So, exactly. yeah, it means accept, surrender. Uh, just, and it's just as simple as, does this thing serve you anymore? Because if it doesn't, and very few of them do, then you can just, amazingly, you're in psychotherapy, you can just let go of it. And as you get more and more still and more and more quiet, the brain has a harder time finding things. Like you said, Richard, in this case, you had to go around and dig around. There has to be something around here someplace. And you find this little old <laughs> tiny thing over there. And it's pulled it up again. Here's something we're not using. The brain wants to, you know, repurpose real estate. So it pulls this thing. What is this thing? Look at this. Look at this. Aren't you? No. And it goes away. And the thing is, sorry. As you but, can drain, drain, drain the swamp down, eventually you'll see a rock here and there. And you pull it up and you get rid of it. It just goes away. Go no, and, and, and the reason why, it's, as you're saying, it's so... Uh, it can be counterintuitive because we're trained to believe in our identity most of all. But our identity is just our idea of who we are. 
And that idea of who we are is just this conglomeration of things we happen to remember about who we are, interpreted through the lens of stories that we happen to have ad hocly put together. And the more we let go of those, the more we see like, wow, who you are is so much more interesting and radiant, uh, you know, than this story. Like, because if you think about it, you know, a cow is much more interesting than the word cow, right? You know, a cow is this dynamic living thing. We're living our life as if we were this kind of like series of labels and ad hoc stories. And we let go of those labels and ad hoc stories. And we go, oh, wow, you know, whew, it's big in here. This is amazing. And, and so you're left in this position of certainty and knowing and control. But there really is a sense of awe at what each of us really is, as opposed to the story we tell ourselves of who we and what we are. We don't have time yet, because we're out of time now, but, but we know the science behind how the brain just happens to grab you know, one-tenth of one percent of all the stuff that experiences flow through us. We know how it does that. It's just haphazard. I mean, this thing that you think you are, this collection, this, this garbage bag of stories, we just haphazardly assemble. It's only a tiny fraction of the experiences you've had. So don't don't get attached to it. Just get over it. They just happen to be there. You can just let go of them. Because there's as much in this present moment right now, there's an infinity of stuff here that's all being crowded out by that old stuff. So the past seems so big, but the present is infinite. And so if we're not focused on the past and we're not focused on the future and we see, we go, oh, there's all this stuff there. That's what's important. This other stuff is just ad hoc and, you know, it, I, I, I can't even say how unimportant it is. It's, it's dead to me. Beautiful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's hugely comforting. Thank you, guys. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. It should be. It's, it really is something to be released. And when you release it, you can feel, oh, it's just like, you know, it's like, you know, this is what, what I think John the Baptist was trying to do with baptism. This is what metanoia, the word in the New Testament for just change in mind, was really about. It's like, look, you're fine. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys. I don't know if you have something you'd like to close with. We're about where we are out of time now. Uh, great questions from everyone tonight. Um, if you, yeah, I'll just leave it to you guys. The only thing I would say is keep honing and asking the questions of yourself and observe and keep inquiring, keep searching, keep looking for where, when, and who this I is. Keep observing these internal thoughts and, and observe that the internal thoughts wither as you observe them. It's like if you look at them, they start to fall apart. There's nothing in our culture that's encouraging anybody to do that. But if you do that, it really is this defragmentation of the hard disk. Everything starts to flow so smoothly and beautifully. And then it's on a runaway process on its own by that time. This is the irreversible part that Gary was pointing to is that there's no stopping it once you do that. And, you know, even the mere fact that you're participating in this probably means there's no stopping it anyway, but it's a faster, more smoother process. If you really go after it, if you feel like, you know, your hair is on fire and you need to get there, you need, you feel like you're being held underwater. You need to get there. You'll get there. I think that, that's her. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone who's here live for your questions. This, yeah, this Erica just said in the chat, this is comforting, very comforting. I, I, I agree. I'll say that again. <laughs> just feeling really good here, ending <laughs> here on this note. I put yeah. a link link in the chat to a page where you can contribute uh, what you can, if, if you can, for this show. We do appreciate it. It helps us pay the tech bills and and keep this coming. So uh, we'll be emailing that to you as well. And we'll be looking to, uh, again, towards the beginning of each month, Sunday if, Sundays if we can. That's our, 
our uh, desired day uh, to do to do these at the beginning of each month, but we'll let you know when the date is uh, honed in. And otherwise, enjoy the rest of your night or, or early morning for some of you, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you again, Gary and Rich. Really amazing session. Appreciate it. Namaste.